You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. Uh, I saw the show. I thought about not playing a clip because, you know what? I don't want to hear his voice. I really don't even want to say his name. I've tried to avoid using his name here on my podcast or in print. But here we are. So if you don't want to hear Milo Yiannopoulos' voice, not because you're easily triggered, my show is not for the easily triggered, and not because you're a snowflake or a cuck or whatever the alt-right slash white nationalist slash neo-Nazi insult of the day happens to be, you might want to skip this week's intro. So, Milo was on real time on Friday night doing his step and felt shit routine, mincing British queen says hateful, bigoted, racist, sexist, transphobic, risible things, and when someone tries to call him on his bullshit, he talks over the interviewer and the other guests, he changes the subject, he tosses out a fake statistic that can't be fact-checked on the fly, all of these moves straight out of the right-wing media training playbook. All Milo adds... It's a pair of studiously limp wrists, a pound of makeup, and a few strands of pearls. It is an act. It is an act that says, you shouldn't take me seriously. I'm just a faggy-ass clown. And while you're laughing at the faggy-ass clown, while you're distracted by the faggy-ass clown act, the faggy-ass clown injects toxins into our political discourse. If there's anything we should know now, right now in America, after seeing a straighty-ass reality show rape clown get elected president, it's that we have to start taking these shitty right-wing clowns seriously. We can't be distracted by their acts anymore. So let's take this clown Milo seriously for a moment. Bill Maher has always loved a good gay joke. Me too. But this time, Bill was distracted by the gay joke sitting in front of him. And unfortunately, on Friday night, Bill's usually reliable, usually Teflon bullshit detectors failed him. He couldn't distinguish between a good gay joke and the toxic gay shit sitting in front of him. So Bill allowed Milo to get away with styling himself as a free speech martyr and a humorist. Bill even compared Milo to Joan Rivers, the comedian. Now, Milo's act is ridiculous. It is a clown show, but he is not a comedian. And there's nothing funny about Milo or his act. There's nothing funny about his racism or his sexism or his xenophobia or his anti-trans bigotry, which got the most airtime on Friday night. Um, I make no apologies for um, protecting women and children right, from men pro- who are confused about their sexual identity. Well, I'm confused about who this is because pronouns are so important. If you call Caitlyn Jenner he or a bad person. So yeah, this I is did it on th- purpose. You did. So this yeah, is a man I mis- who... I misgendered yeah, right. this person. Right. So this is a man, born man, who, who wants to... Who thinks that he might be a girl. Okay. And, and you um, have a problem with that. No, I don't have a problem with it, but I think that women and, ch- and, and girls should be protected from having people, who, men who are confused about their sexual identities in their bathrooms. That that's, person... That's not unreasonable. That person... No, yeah, actually, you know, that is, is unreasonable. And Milo should have been called on it. And thank God, Larry Wilmore was on the panel. <laughs> on the I just panel. think it's sad because decorated. the same arguments that we use against gay people, treating them like aliens who just wanted to fuck anything that moved, and that's why we should avoid them at all costs. <laughs> no, I think it's there's a big used, difference. Well, let me As I said on Real Time the last time I was on the show, the same arguments being used against trans people today were used against gay men decades ago. Oh, they're a danger to men and boys. They lurk in bathrooms. They're demanding access to public spaces, to public restrooms, to schools, to Boy Scout troops, because because they want to prey on children. It was bullshit when those lies were used to attack gay men, and it's bullshit now that those lies are being repackaged and used to attack trans women today. And it's not just garden variety, whatever, political bullshit. It is dangerous bullshit. Right-wing assholes keep hammering away at the threat posed by trans people using public toilets, when in reality, trans men and women, particularly trans women, are at higher risk of violent attack, hate crimes, and murder than any other group. Trans women of color at highest risk. And while it's true that cis women and trans women are sometimes attacked in public toilets, these attacks are perpetrated by cis men, not trans women. 
You don't have to take my word for it. Google this shit. Google woman or girl assaulted in public restroom and you will find a lot of stories. A lot of them. A depressing number of them. And all of them are about straight cis men attacking women and girls in public restrooms. You want to make the world a safer place for women and girls? Make it a crime for cis men to use public toilets. Now this bullshit argument, this lie that trans women are really male sexual predators prowling ladies' rooms... It amounts in the end to an anti-trans blood libel. It justifies and leads to violent attacks against trans women. And any gay person who makes this argument, he needs to have his cock-sucking mouth slapped off his lying face. This argument, this lie, it does not protect women. It gets women killed. And Milo knows it and he doesn't care and he's gleefully cashing in on it. Because there's nothing the right wing loves to throw money at more than a black person willing to say black people are the real racists or a queer person willing to say queer people are the real threat. And if that wasn't bad enough, unbelievably, Milo went on later to assert that trans people are disproportionately involved in sexual assault, which is not true. It is another lie, another big dangerous lie. And if you watch the show, Milo's deployment of this lie was again straight out of the right-wing media playbook. He threw it out there, he called it a statistic, and there was no pushback because he couldn't be fact-checked in real time. So the damage was done in real time on real time. Thank God, again, Larry Wilmore was on the panel. Wait, hold on, Bill. (laughs) You can go fuck yourself, all right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if this is the face if of your the argument is that these people are stupid, you didn't hear a word this man said no. early in this segment because yes. he can talk circles around your right. pathetic, this guy. douchey little ass for me. I was going to end there with that very satisfying cheer, but postscript, while I was sitting down to work on the opening of today's show... A video surfaced, two videos surfaced of Milo defending sex between adult men and 13-year-old boys. I could play a clip of that tape too, but you know what? I'm not going to. We've had enough Milo for one day. If you want to hear that, you can Google it yourself. But it has to be noted quickly, on Real Time Friday night, Milo attacked trans women and said he was doxing and outing trans women who he insists are men to stop them from raping children. And then it comes out that Milo, more than once, has defended adult men having sex with 13 and 14-year-old boys. Ugh. Take it away, Larry. You can go fuck yourself, all right? Yeah. 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 That needed to be said. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much. Okay, on the free micro edition of the Savage Lovecast this week, tons of your Q, lots of my A, and on the subscription magnum edition of the Savage Lovecast, professional dominatrix Justine Cross joins me to field a few questions. To subscribe to the Magnum Savage Lovecast, go to savagelovecast.com. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by going to casper.com slash savage love and entering the promo code savage love. Today's Savage Lovecast is brought to you by me, Undies, high quality, super comfortable, good looking undies. Get 20% off your first order when you go to meundies.com slash savage. Support for Savage Love comes from Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interests in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash savage. Hello, uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. I am a 39-year-old, straight, married male. I also run a small business, and the question is, actually uh, about my assistant manager. He's also a late 30s straight male. He's in a heterosexual relationship with a, a woman who uh, is, is violently abusive towards him. You know, he's, he's, he's uh, been with her for about a year. Uh, I know of at least five occurrences, you know, where this has happened. Uh, what's obvious just from the, the, the black eyes and broken noses and the claw marks and you know I've, I've, I've sat down with him I've, I've told him that you know I, I know you know what's really going on you didn't really fall down some stairs and you know I've had to had customers that 
you know, regular clients and customers that, you know, have, have asked about, you know, what's happening with them. And I, I find myself having to feed them the, the same lines and, and, you know, just kind of cover up this, this abuse. And I, I know the man is, is socially awkward, you know, and, and doesn't really have a support network of people to, you know, help him out, but, but he is a valuable you know, member of my operation and I really need to help him. And I, I've told him, you know, when this happened again, uh, right around Christmas, I, I told him that, you know, he, he really needs to, to end it with this girl, you know, it's not going to get any better. And, you know, he, he said he would, and I've come to find out he is not. And it, it's getting to where I, 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 my operation cannot have this continue going on, but I think about replacing them over this. You know, I, I think to myself, if this was happening to a female employee of mine, that, you know, that this wouldn't even be an issue. I, I would be moving up in the earth and, and doing whatever I could. Uh, but it, it, I, I, I have no idea what to do. Abuse victims, when confronted, particularly by coworkers, not family members, will often leap to the defense of the person who is abusing them or deny that they're being abused at all, maybe because they feel ashamed of themselves, maybe they don't want to be seen as what they are, as a, a victim. Maybe they fear the end of the relationship despite the abuse because they're economically dependent or socially or sexually dependent on their abuser. So it's a really good sign that when you pulled this guy aside and confronted him, he didn't deny that he was being abused. He agreed with you when you said he needed to get out of this relationship. He didn't dispute your characterization of the relationship as abusive. He didn't get out of it over the holidays. He didn't get out of it right away as quickly as you would have wished, but you've planted a seed. He knows he needs to get out of it and you got to step up for this guy. You say that he's isolated. It sounds like he's isolated everywhere but at work where he has a relationship with you. If there is a position that you can move him to for the time being where he doesn't have face-to-face -face interactions with clients, please consider doing so. If you know that he has family that he's not in touch with or that he may be estranged from, that she may have engineered his isolation from, reach out to them. Step up. Also, it's time to call the police. Sometimes law enforcement doesn't take it seriously when a man is the victim of domestic violence. But I think with you there making the call, another man standing there making the call, a witness, likelier to be taken seriously, unfortunately, you wish that weren't the case, but likelier to be taken seriously. So step up, call the police. When he comes in and he is battered and bruised, Call the police. Tell him you are calling the police. Tell him you're going to call the police each and every time it happens and that the police are going to come and talk to him. And hopefully you live in a city or a state that has domestic violence laws that take into account the fact that people will often defend their abuser. So police will intervene. Police will make an arrest to protect the victim, even if the victim is denying as they stand there with a black eye and a broken nose covered in scratches that they were abused at all. So you really do need to call the police. And I think you should tell him that his job is at stake. Perhaps that will motivate him finally to do something, to gather up his courage and his strength, to lean on you a little bit, to avail himself of the services of the police. So they can connect him with abuse victim services in your area and get the fuck away from this violent, toxic woman. Hi, Dan, and a tech savvy at first use. I have a new partner, and the sex is really great. However, I can't really come without touching myself while we're having PIV sex. And even when I do that, I have to, like, clench my eyes shut and play my masturbate reel in my head the whole time. It's fine, and it works, and it's fun that we come together, and I come every time we have sex. But it also makes me wonder if it's a bad habit that I should try to break, because I definitely disconnect from the moment when I do it. I'd love to learn how to come just from being in the moment, whether or not I'm touching myself. Any advice? I'm glad that you don't feel conflicted about touching yourself. There are a lot of women out there who need to touch themselves during PIV intercourse in order to come or need their partners to touch them or need to apply a vibrator in order to climax during PIV. And they feel very self-conscious about it. They feel like they're doing something wrong. I will sometimes direct these women to gay pornography 
Watch the guy doing PIA. Watch the guy getting penis and assed. Watch the guy getting fucked. And what he's doing as he's getting fucked often is stroking himself. Unselfconsciously, unapologetically, the guy fucking his ass doesn't feel like he's doing anal sex wrong because the guy he's fucking has to resort to stroking his dick. And what is a dick but a great big clit? Look at that guy. Look at that gay guy getting his ass fucked. He's playing with his giant clit. Ladies, you shouldn't feel at all self-conscious while you're getting your twat fucked or your ass fucked about playing with your clit, just like the fags do. Play with your clit. But that's not a problem. That's another problem here. You are not conflicted about that. You are, I think, rightly troubled about having to zoom out of the moment into your masturbatory loop, into the tape in your head, into your solodex. And yeah, that is a little disconcerting, maybe depressing, that you have to disengage from the sex, from the moment you're in, and concentrate on the porn loop and concentrate on your fantasy. So how do you retrain your brain and retrain your junk? Well, I think you play with your clit while you're getting fucked and force yourself to keep your eyes open. It'll help if you can tell your partner what you've been doing and what you've always done with all your partners that you rely on this tape loop in your head while you play with your clit while you're getting fucked and you kind of pull out of the moment. You withdraw. Because what you need him to do is to keep you in the moment, to keep you engaged. And the way to do that is dirty fucking talk. If your eyes are wide open and you're looking into his eyes as he fucks you and you guys are talking to each other, dirty talking about what you're doing or dirty talking about the stuff that you're going to do in the future together, dirty talking about those fantasies, that's the bridge for you. Rather than saying, here are my fantasies, here are my go-to dirty thoughts, mental images that help me climax, I'm going to throw those all in the trash bin and I'm going to just stare at my partner's neck or face or think about how sexy they are or this is. No, 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 no. The bridge, the, the training wheels that'll help you get into the moment is look at your partner and have your partner talk to you about your tape reel a little bit. Talk about your fantasies. Talk about the things that turn you on. Talk about the things that, that help to get you there and fold them into that moment with your partner. So you're in both places at once. You are present with your partner, conversing with your partner, dirty talking, fucking your partner, playing with your clit, also tossing around these dirty images and thoughts and ideas and fantasies and past experiences, whatever you need to kick around in that moment to get you there. And then hopefully you can do that a little less and less over time. Not the talking, not the being present, not the eye contact, but the invoking of these fantasies, these go-to mental images that you can pair those away in time and talk less about what you might like to do or have done or want to do with them, but talk more about what you are doing in that moment with them. And that'll help bridge the gap for you and you will be climaxing while you play with your clit. Don't stop playing with your clit and very much in the moment. Support for the Savage Lovecast comes from Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, it is important to work with someone you can trust and someone who has your best interests in mind. With Rocket Mortgage, you'll get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. Don't waste time searching through stacks of paperwork. With Rocket Mortgage, you can securely share your financial info to get a mortgage approval in minutes. You can even adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to make sure you get the mortgage solution that's right for you. Whether you're looking to buy a home or refinance your existing mortgage, you can lift the burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. Skip the bank, skip the waiting, and go completely online at quickenloans.com slash savage. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. Hi, Stan. I'm a 28-year-old female from um, the west coast of Florida, and I just have a question. I don't know who the asshole is in this situation, if it's me or my friend. So my best friend from years and years and years, uh, she's bisexual. She's had a lot of serious boyfriends, not a serious girlfriend, but when we go out, we'll go out just the two of us a lot, and we'll kind of, um, like, get really affectionate. And when I'm drunk, like, I like to make out with her and, you know, all, all that stuff and hold her hand. And we very much act like a couple. And it's really fun. And it's never been a problem until recently. She's been really um, lonely. You know, she really wants relationships, having a hard time with one. And she's getting really angry with me because I don't want to, like, try any girl stuff with her. Like, like I'll kiss her, I'll make out with her, I'll hold her. We'll cuddle, we'll watch TV, but especially when I'm sober, the last thing I want to do is touch her vagina. 
it freaks me out. But see, when we're out, she encourages it and likes it. But then the next day, she gets really upset with me and mad at me that I won't give it a chance. And sometimes she gets a little too pushy, and I end up getting mad at her because it's not something I want to do, and I feel really, you know, pushed, and I don't appreciate that. But I don't know if I'm wrong or she's wrong. What do I do? We go out all the time. We drink a lot. We hang out a lot on the weekends, especially just us two, because we don't agree a lot on, you know, our mutual friends. So a lot of times it's just us two. Even if it's not just us two, we do tend to fall back on kind of acting like we're dating. So I don't know, you know, I don't want to stop going out with her. And I told her everything I can think of that, you know, hey, I really enjoy it, and it's really fun at nighttime when we're drinking, but the next day, those feelings just go away, and she gets really mad at me, so I don't know what to do. I don't want this to be weird, you know? I don't ever want to try anything with her, besides the fact that I don't want to, I don't want to make our friendship weird. You don't want this to be weird? Too fucking late. This is weird, and it's kind of not very nice of you. You asked me to... Issue a ruling. Who's the asshole? You're the asshole. I don't think your assholery in this instance is fully conscious. I don't think it's malicious, but it's certainly thoughtless. Let's think this through. You think you're toying with her body when you're out and you are pretending to date, when in actuality, as she experiences it, you are toying with her emotions. You act like you're dating her for fun because you're drunk and that's the end of it for you. She acts like she's dating you and she hopes that that's the start of something potentially. So now that you know this, now that you know that this fun is painful for your friend, it has to fucking stop as much as you might enjoy it. If you continue to enjoy it, if you continue to take advantage of your friend in this way that leaves her in pain and hurt and feeling rejected, you are not then a thoughtless asshole. You are just an asshole because now you know. Now you have to think about the things that I told you. Now you know what you're doing. And I don't think you were doing it maliciously. You were just heteroflexible and young and dumb and fun, but she is bisexual and she is obviously attracted to you. And all of these interactions fuel her desire for you and her desire to be in a relationship with you that you have no interest in being in. So you got to knock it the fuck off. You have to establish some boundaries with this friend. You need to say to her, all of this homosocial contact, all of this cuddling, all of these displays of affection meant one thing for me. They mean something else for you. It can never go anywhere on my side and it's hurting you what we're doing. And so we're just going to stop doing that. We're not going to be cuddle buddies. We're not going to go out to bars and get drunk and make out. I'm no longer going to allow you to pour your sexual attention and interest into me when you should be taking that sexual energy and that desire and turning this town upside down, looking for a girl or a guy who can be your boyfriend or girlfriend. Because I can't be your boyfriend, certainly, and I have no interest in being a girlfriend. So boundaries. No more of this. We are friends who don't make out, which is Most of the kinds of friendships in the world. We're going to have that kind of friendship now going forward. The friends who don't get drunk, make out, cuddle, whatever else, that's over. Because it's hurting you. And I don't want to be a party to hurting you. And I don't want to be in a bar with you and sending out the signal that you are unavailable to everyone else in the bar. Because you are available. But if I'm hanging off you and you're hanging off me... Other women, other men who might be attracted to are not going to approach unless they're assholes. And then you're not certainly not going to want to date an asshole. But other decent people who might be interested in you, you might be interested in, they're not going to offer to buy you a drink. They're not going to come up and ask you to dance. They're not going to hit on you. They're not going to make eyes at you. And so I'm costing you potential partners, people who could be your girlfriend, people who could be your boyfriend. And I'm not going to do that anymore. Because I'm going to be a good friend, which means I'm going to be a friend with boundaries and I am not going to be the asshole anymore. This episode of Savage Love Cast is brought to you by Casper. Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. 
Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and passing those savings directly on to you, the consumer. The Casper mattress provides long-lasting comfort and support, and I know this because me and my husband sleep on one every night. You can buy it easily online and completely risk-free. Casper offers free delivery and painless returns within a 100-day period so you don't have to lie down in a showroom. And Casper's mattresses uphold the highest environmental production standards, and they're made right here in the USA. Get a Casper mattress for $500 for a twin or $950 for a king-sized mattress, but you can save an additional 50 bucks as one of our listeners by going to casper.com slash savage love and entering the promo code savage love that's casper.com slash savage love and promo code savage love terms and conditions apply hi dan i'm calling because i'm curious about gags and bondage particularly my boyfriend likes to gag me as in like put something either like in or over my mouth when we're having sex which is fine. Like, it's not really my kink, but he really likes it. And I like bondage, so it's fun. But I'm wondering, because I can't say anything and something's over my mouth, how do you use a safe word or how do you communicate when to stop or tap out if your thing is gagging? First, best practices. If he's putting something in your mouth to gag you, it can't be so small or so loose that it can push in and fall down the back of your throat and cut off your air. So you're going to want to use proper bondage BDSM gear. This is one of those things you say to people who are interested in BDSM, interested in bondage. You could get handcuffs cheap and you can get rope cheap, but you're likelier to hurt yourself using those things. So you might want to invest in real bondage gear. And people are like, oh, no, that's too hardcore for me. When it's actually safer, it looks hardcore, but it's safer. Same thing with gags, an actual ball gag, an actual bit gag, penis gag, whatever kinds of gags you prefer that's designed for that, it's going to be a lot safer than balling up a sock and stuffing it in someone's mouth. And you should never leave somebody who's been gagged alone. You never know what could happen. They could, if it's an improvised gag, it could slip down their throat. They could begin to choke. If it's a real gag, a gag designed for BDSM play, if you leave them alone, they could, at that moment, that you're gone, discover that the clams they had for dinner were bad and begin to throw up and choke or their sinuses could begin to get stopped and they could not be able to get uh, enough air. So please, best practices. As for safe words when you're gagged, that's pretty easy. And your boyfriend, if he's going to be the dom top, should have discussed this with you or known to discuss this with you. So you two obviously together need to read some SM 101 books, but here you go. You have a ball in your hand. You have a little rubber ball that you hold. And if you drop that ball, that's you using your safe word. Or you have a pattern of grunts, like mm, 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 like four in a row or three in a row that mean take this out of my mouth or untie me or there's a problem and it's you safe wording out. Easy and simple. Either. Both workable. Here at the Lovecast, we want you to look sexy. We just do. And the first step is really quite easy. You got to get some MeUndies. What are MeUndies? They're seriously soft, feel-good undies delivered right to your door. MeUndies are designed in L.A. and made from sustainably sourced micro-modal, a fabric three times softer than cotton. MeUndies' softer-than-soft luxe undies come in an ever-changing selection of classic colors, bold shapes, and adventurous patterns so you can tailor your undies to your own personal style. And you can save time and money each month with a monthly subscription. And if you're not ready for a subscription, that's okay. You can still save. That's because MeUndies is offering you 20% off your first pair. Just use our special URL, MeUndies.com slash savage and get 20% off your first pair. So go ahead, revamp your underwear drawer. I command you. Once again, that's MeUndies.com slash savage. MeUndies.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I'm a 20-something lady living in the South, but I'm from Seattle. Love you. I am a career sports coach. I work with a lot of teenagers and they tell me about their lives and I often you know, do a lot of counseling, but I got one the other day and I want to know if I answered it right. This teenage boy comes up and asks me how he can pull dudes. And I was like, what? Um, and then upon examining a little, he says he's bi and he says he's out. And I said, oh, congrats. And I quoted you and said, uh, it's a good thing you're out because, you know, the world needs more people being out 
especially when they're five, they're not a hidden population or I'm not believed, et cetera, et cetera. Told them to listen to your podcast, obviously made my little plug. Um, and then we got into like, you know, how you show someone you're interested without being gross. Not like, oh, your eyes sparkle when you laugh, you know, because that doesn't work on anyone. You know, the best I could really muster was you tell them something you wouldn't say to a friend. Um, like, oh, I really enjoy your company or I really like hanging out with you. If you think that about your friends, but you don't say it to them. And we live in Atlanta. It's fine here. You're not going to get beat up. But I do think that you should probably be subtle about it. I'm just curious about your thoughts. If we're talking a teenager who's 18, he has the option of getting on dating apps. He may encounter a lot of shitty predatory people on dating apps. Shitty predatory people are everywhere. If we're talking a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old, there are other questions you need to ask him before you give him advice about pickup lines for picking up other teenage boys. Like, are you out to your family? Do you have your family's support? Are your peers homophobic? If you asked somebody out or told them they had nice hair or you enjoyed spending time with them, if you said something to them that clearly indicated a romantic interest in them, and then that person freaked out and ran around telling everyone else on the team, everyone else in your school, what are the possible repercussions of that for you? 40% of homeless kids, teenagers, are LGBT kids who were kicked out or thrown out after they came out or were outed to their families. So you need to tiptoe through this minefield when you're giving advice to teenagers who are dependent on their families. So before I can tell you what the magic words are, I would want to ask him or ask you to ask him all these other questions. Is he out? Does he have his family support? Does he have a backup plan if he should ever be outed? Does he have friends who are on his side and in his corner? Is he out to anybody else on the team about being bi? If the answer to all those questions are yes, yes, out, 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 and everybody loves me and I live in the liberal blue dot that is Atlanta and I don't fear for my safety and I don't fear becoming homeless if everybody knows me to be bi, then you just encourage him to be out of the closet, to look for queer youth support groups in his area, to join the GSA, to see if there aren't any queer youth events in his area that he can begin to attend. And if he's out socially to his peers, to the other guys on his team, if he's out in his school, the other gay and bi kids, guys who may not be out yet, who might be interested in him, will begin to circle him. If they fear being outed by expressing an interest in him, they're going to run from him wherever he goes. But if they're ready themselves to come out of the closet or have that first relationship, they will sidle up to him. So it's really about being out. It's not about magic words or pickup lines. It's about living authentically. Not all bisexual male teenagers are in a place where they can risk living authentically. And that's what you need to drill down with him about first. Hi, Dan. I'm a gay 23-year-old woman living in a mid-sized city in the southeastern United States. I had a question for you about dating when other parts of your life are falling apart. My father was diagnosed with a pretty shitty cancer in August, just when I was starting to date this girl. And long story short, it was decided at the time by both she and I that I was just too depressed and fucked up to be starting to date someone. But the longer this cancer process goes on with dad's chemo, et cetera, it is made super clear that I won't ever not be fucked up about this, especially since this cancer is super terminal. Um, I'm doing much better since the original diagnosis. I'm not depressed all the time. I exercise. I go to work. I'm functioning and enjoying my life, but obviously definitely not operating at 100%. The girl that I dated was someone who was starting to get to know me pretty well, and we had a friendship before we dated, so it makes me think that meeting brand new people to date would be even harder because when I start talking about my life, I sound like the biggest pile of baggage as well as slightly unstable. I'm interested in meeting people and dating. I'm super young. I want to get out there. Basically, my question is, how fucked up is too fucked up? I know that we'll never be in perfect working condition, that everyone has shit, but how do you not scare people away with your baggage? Slash, should I even be trying to date at this point in my life at all? Thanks, Dan. We talked about good working order last week and the importance of being in good working order and the fact that good working order doesn't mean perfect and no problems and no baggage. It just means functional. You're a car that can go. You sound like a car that can go. You sound to me as if you are in good working order. 
some people may be spooked by the fact that you're dealing with a parent with a terminal illness at this point in your life and not ready to partner with you. And we can't just ascribe that to cowardice uh, or fear of death on that other person's part. If you are dating someone or thinking about dating someone and you find out they're going through some really horrible family issues or trauma, I think people will subconsciously realize that it may force them to commit before they're ready to commit because they're going to be in a position where they feel like they have to be as supportive as possible. So people will begin to date somebody. There'll be a family crisis, family emergency. A parent will be diagnosed with a terminal illness or suddenly die. And they will bond over the trauma before they know whether or not they really are a match, whether they really are good for each other, where they really should be together. So dating someone who's facing something like that, I think can scare people off, not just because they're bad people, not just because they're not willing to do the work emotionally, not just because they fear death or the stink of death, but because they fear committing for the wrong reasons. And they may want to wait until you have handled this trauma, processed it, and then perhaps pick up then. So some people may regard the fact that your father is dying as an indication that even if you're in good working order, now is not the time that the relationship wouldn't be in good working order. And you might commit too soon, not because you're into each other, but because of this trauma. And that wouldn't be a problem if people didn't regard the end of a relationship as a failure. If you began to see someone and a couple weeks into it, their dad or mom got a a terminal diagnosis and you just bonded and, and, and helped and were there for that person at that time of their life that They really needed somebody in their corner providing them with support and also distraction. And then six months later, a year later, after the death, you realize that, no, this isn't someone you want to spend decades with. It wouldn't be a problem if we didn't regard a relationship ending as always a failure. It wouldn't be a problem to say, we came together for this intense time in your life and my life, and now we're going to part, and we will always have the memory of what we meant to each other during this difficult time in your life and the life of your family. And we can honor that and go our separate ways and be friends. And people have a hard time with that because the culture says if a relationship ends without one of you dying or both of you dying, that was a failure and people fear failure. So they will run from someone who has a parent who's dying. So although I think you're in good working order and you certainly sound as if you're in good working order, The woman that you think about dating, a woman you might meet, she might not regard you as in good working order at this moment for all sorts of reasons, some valid and some not. So my heart goes out to you and your family at this time, and my heart goes out to your dad, and I think you need to be there for him, you need to take care of him, and you need to engage in acts of self-care as well. And that can include some dating and some sex, and you should say to the women that you meet or you think about dating... Look, if you want a date date, not just hook up, you need to know that I'm going through a particularly rough patch with my family right now because my dad is dying. And if she wants to stick around and be a help and be there for you, let her. And if she pulls back because that's too much for her right now, don't hate her. Hey, Dan. Um, I am a 19-year-old gay male from the Northwest, and I have a bit of a tricky problem. So I'm, I would say that I am conventionally attractive. I'm just kind of like a, a twinky college kid kind of preppy. But the problem is my body is like completely different when I lift up my shirt. I have, um, I have boobs and I've had boobs since I was, uh, very young, like 11. And so I've seen doctors about it. They thought it might have been a little bit of a hormonal imbalance, nothing that needed to be really corrected. And then it would go away with time. And now I'm 19 and they're still here. So um, I should clarify that um, I was bullied about it in in gym class and I've had a lot of internal struggles about it. But I've come to the conclusion that I don't want to just remove them because they're a part of me. And if if I was to remove it, it wouldn't have been for me. It would have been for other people. So, like, I've chosen to keep them because... They're a part of me, just like my sexuality. Um, So I've had trouble with dating and dating apps. I mean, like being gay and 19, I'm in like a a state of kinder queer where I'm not able to go to bars. Most events are 21 and over. So I tend to use dating apps. And because of this, I've had experiences where people aren't excited about my chest, which is, is fine. 
but um, kind of annoying when you're talking with people and then you finally meet and then you meet for the second time to to play and then you're like, oh, you have tits and that's not what I want. And uh, yeah, so that's fine. It's just that it's annoying to have both our time wasted. Generally, I've dealt this by specifically looking for bi guys um, because they tend to like it, but it limits my dating pool. Uh, plus on apps and events for men who like men, people don't walk around with signs saying that they like tits. So um, I've tried being straight up about it, but people are treating me like a freak show on Grindr and Tinder where I get a lot of messages uh, a day, not from guys who want to date or fuck, but from people who don't know how to do a simple Google search about it. Um, so is there a way to balance this out where I'm able to f uh, like field people on these apps um, on people who'd be fine with this or even like it, but not have to deal with the uh, idiots who are, are curious about it, but not curious enough to actually research it. Like, also, what the hell do I call myself? Is it fair to call myself like a gay male? Should I call myself like a, a, a kind of gay male or male with extra bells and whistles? Gynecomastia is the condition where some men, some young men, will develop what appear to be breasts, breast tissue. Mo boobs, like you described them. Uh, according to Mayo Clinic, in most cases, guys with gynecomastia, the condition writes itself in time, particularly when it develops in adolescence. But in other cases, it doesn't. And there are some medications that may be effective. And there's also surgery to remove or reduce the excess breast tissue on the male. You say you've talked to doctors. Doesn't sound like you want treatment. Doesn't sound like you're interested in the surgery. It sounds actually like you may very much like your breasts, like your tits. And so you don't want to alter them or remove them just to fit into other people's ideas of what a twink body ought to look like and what a male body ought to look like. And more power to you. And I respect your decision. It is going to make dating a little more challenging for you and hooking up a little more challenging for you. And you're going to encounter idiots and people who say things out of ignorance because it's such a rarish condition that most guys will not have encountered someone with this who didn't seek treatment and didn't opt for surgery if that was an option. So there's no middle ground here. There's no compromise position between having to deal with idiocy and having a very limited dating pool or having to opt for surgery and correct this thing about your body that you don't regard as in need of correction. So you have to pick your poison the difficulty dating or the surgery and the alteration that you don't want. When it comes to differences, sometimes it helps to lead with them, even if it attracts some negative attention, because if what you're looking for are those guys who might be attracted to your difference, your body type, not into you despite the fact that you have tits, but in part because of it, your experience with some of the bi guys you've been with, then you need to just Brave it out. You need to put it out there as you've done. You've said on Grindr and other dating apps, you need to put it out there, which means you're going to attract some negative attention. You're going to attract some pushback from assholes and you just need to write them off as assholes. You don't have to interact with them and you can block them. But putting that out there is the only way to find the guys who are going to be into the guy that you are. And you don't have to come up with some other term for you than just gay dude. You're a gay dude who has tits that you like and don't want to have off and you want to be with someone who's going to be attracted to your particular body type, which is standard issue, attractive young twink with a bonus feature, which for a bi guy might be great. And for some guys who are into bodies that are kind of a blend or a mix, it'll be a selling point. And that's the kind of guy you want to be with. I wish I could bubble wrap the world and make it safer for you to be out there and be comfortable and you sound comfortable about yourself and about your body without encountering any jerkos but the jerkos are out there and <laughs> there's something about jerkoness that disinhibits people around particularly on the internet just sending off some asshole comment or asshole message and you're gonna have to have a thick skin and pay no mind to that shit block 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 delete 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 and tell yourself that with each block and each deletion you're getting a little bit closer to the guy or guys who are going to be into you. Hey, Dan. Sex question for you. I get 
super grossed out by cum. Like, it literally makes me gag if someone comes in my mouth to the point that I've decided I can't do it anymore. I do want to be GGG, so I'm fine with a guy coming on me somewhere. So, honestly, it kind of grosses me out in general. I get squished out by the warm, pumping liquid squirting all over me, but I'm totally willing to put up a bit. How do I tell my boyfriend that I really can't handle cum above the neck without offending him or making him feel like I think that he's gross? Cum's a little like Guinness. It's an acquired taste. You've got to knock back a few pints before it starts to taste good. But it sounds like you've made a good faith effort to attempt to acquire the taste and you may be one of those people who just never warms to Guinness to stretch and torture the metaphor or the analogy or whatever the fuck that was. So you get a uh, no cum in your mouth free card. You don't have to do this. You tried and it's not for you and you don't enjoy it. I have controversially said in my column, written in my column, that the blowjob is over when the orgasm starts. That if you get somebody off, if they're coming, you don't have to swallow it. Where the cum goes, how exactly the cum is disposed of is at the discretion of the blowjob giver. There may be blowjob receivers who are very invested in having their cum eaten, but it's up to the giver. You got him off. You used your mouth. You made him come. Whether you spit or swallow, let it run out of your mouth, point the dick over your shoulder at the last minute and let him hit the cat. Whatever you decide to do at that moment with the semen is up to you, the blowjob giver. So I think you can say to your boyfriend, just straight up, I don't like it. I don't like the sensation. I don't like the taste and I never have. And it's not about you. And I tried, I knocked back a few pints and never developed a taste for it. And it's kind of the price of admission to be with you. And then you communicate to him that you don't think he's disgusting, that you don't think his cum is revolting by being GGG and allowing him to come on you below the neck and not treating his cum like it's toxic waste and being good about it, just as he should be good about your vaginal secretions and not freak out or react to them negatively. And hopefully he's going down on you. And remember, ladies, you kind of come on his face too. You just come one thin shellacking layer at a time. It's a gradual application as opposed to a Jackson Pollock like burst all there at the end. But a guy who's going down on you, you're coming on his face. You're c coming all over his face. You're secreting all over his face, particularly if you're a squirter, then you're practically drowning him at the last second. So just something to bear in mind as you give and receive oral pleasure, as they say. Hi, Dan. I'm calling in response to episode 538 to the caller who was questioning the paternity of the baby she's pregnant with. You gave great advice per usual, but I wanted to add that the ultrasound estimates are notoriously faulty. So um, that may not be accurate. The date may fluctuate again as her pregnancy progresses. So it's possible that it is her boyfriend who is the father. Uh, and the second thing I thought of was that it's possible to get a paternity test done um, while the infant is in utero. So that may be something that she would discuss with her doctor that could give her peace of mind. Hey, Dan, I was calling in response to um, the caller who is pregnant and um, her boyfriend is looking at her emails and, you know, telling her who he is. And I just want to say to her, don't leave that relationship. Run from that relationship. That sounds uh, pretty word for word what happened to me when I was seven months pregnant with my daughter, and I stuck around, and um, I thought, you know, he's a good person most of the time, and we all have faults and insecurities, and I stayed, and um, when she was a month old, I walked in on him hitting her. So now I have full custody, and I ran my ass out of there, and I got a restraining order, and I just wish that I could stop any woman from ever having to go through that agony again with a newborn child. So get the hell out of there. Thanks, Dan. You're absolutely right about abusers. And uh, always remember, someone will tell you who they are if you listen. Hi, Dan. This is for the woman who called about her neighbor with all of the Trump paraphernalia in his yard. I would recommend that she find out who the progressive candidates are in her region, uh, everybody from you know school board and municipal elections all the way up to the Senate. 
and discover her yard in signs for those people. Because the only way we're going to win this is if we get progressive people serving at every level of government. And we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you want to record a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. Want to hear me rant at length about politics with Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Eli Sanders and future Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Rich Smith? Check out the Strangers Blabbermouth podcast. Read my weekly columns, Savage Love, in newspapers all over the country, including the Chicago Reader. Get your Impeach the Motherfucker Already hats, buttons, t-shirts, lapel pins, and now coffee cups at itmfa.org or impeachthemotherfuckeralready.com. All proceeds benefit the American Civil Liberties Union, Planned Parenthood, and the International Refugee Assistance Project. Follow me on Twitter at Fake Dan Savage. Follow Justine Cross on Twitter, and that's an order at Justine Plays. The Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at risk you and Nancy. We will all be back at you next week with an installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thanks for downloading.